All right, everyone, and welcome back to another Lions Guide podcast. And on today's episode, we've got Dave Zampano, who is the founder of Lawyers with Purpose. He's also host of the Legal Community podcast and co-founder with my other guest here today, Guy Remond. Got it right, Guy? Did I get it right? That's it, Dale. Spot on. <laughs> uh, Guy's got over 20 years in tech, software and consulting, advisory, uh, as a founder, director, investor, and other advisory roles. So guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. So we'll start with you, Dave. Tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. When you tell someone you're a lawyer, they think a certain thing. But uh, I'm actually an entrepreneur that happened to go to law school, right? So uh, I grew up in a family business. I, I didn't know any different. My, my mom's father started a food and paper back in 1927. So it's now in its 95th year. And my brothers, wow. the third generation, are, are currently running it. And um, most people grow up um, in a household, you know, that's fairly normal. I grew up in a household that I thought was normal. Um, but it was, I had my mom and a dad when, when you got done every day, every, the conversation around the dinner table was always like a boardroom. Uh, so we were always exposed to the business issues to add to that. I was the youngest of 10 kids. And so, uh, they had their own uh, football team that helped in the business. And, uh, so from a young age, I was just exposed to, to business. I never understood that I was being exposed to that till many years later when I finished high school and went off to college. Um, I got my accounting degree and became a CPA and worked for one of the, what at the time was the big eight accounting firms. Now they're the big four and um, worked with them, got my CPA and decided to go back to law school. Um, mainly because I couldn't get lawyers to return my calls. <laughs> so I said, I'll go learn it myself. Um, that's what <laughs> entrepreneurs do, isn't it? They, they, they continue to learn their lifetime learners. And so I continued to, to learn and got my Juris Doctorate uh, and my law degree and passed the bar exam in two states and practice, began practicing estate planning, elder law, and asset protection. Um, so the interesting thing with that, Dale, was... Um, in the industry, you know, lawyers tend to be laggards. You know, they're not typically the first ones to jump onto something new. Um, and back in the 90s, when I came out of law school in the early 90s, something big was coming out called living trust, right? What's a living trust? So those really started to become known in the late 80s and into the early 90s. And so I started doing revocable living trusts and then irrevocable trusts. And I started innovating inside the law, believe it or not. And so I, um, by the late 90s, I had innovated a asset protection trust called the IPUG Protection Trust, um, Irrevocable Pure Grantor Trust is what IPUG stands for. And what it did is it gave uh, consumers freedom to create an irrevocable trust that they could control, they could benefit from, but was still protected from creditors, predators, and other people who would want to get at it. And mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to what makes a successful business or entrepreneur coming up with that innovation really came from listening to clients. Clients said, you know, I want to protect my assets, but I don't want to give up control of them. And so that started the innovations that I started doing in the law in my local practice. Well, my local practice started growing because of it. Um, and over time I joined a national organization by the late nineties and within a year of joining, they identified me as a standout attorney in the country for what I was doing in my practice. So I started talking in the hallways to people. And by the end of the event, we used to go every quarter somewhere in the country as an organization, and we would all meet and learn new things. Well, the head of the national organization came to me and said, uh, would you speak and teach all the other lawyers in the country what it is you're doing? They're all interested in it. So that was, I think, October of 01. And uh, I presented uh, about um, my IPUG protection trust back in 99 and 2000. In 2001, I talked about my next innovation, which was teaching lawyers how to protect assets so people can qualify for Medicaid and uh, to pay for their long-term care in a nursing home. So lawyers like, you can't do that. What are you talking about? So I'm actually credited as being the innovator of the Medicaid practice industry in America. And that was mm. my next innovation. Again, listening to the wants of the clients. Clients say, I want yeah. 
I don't want to lose my lifetime of assets. And how do I get someone else or uh, benefits to pay for long-term care? So um, once I started doing that single teaching, they wanted me just to do an hour and a half training, which I did. But by the end of it, the national organization, the members went crazy and they said to the national organization, we need to know more. And the head of the national organization said to me, Dave, um, they want you to teach them how to do this. And I was the first attorney that organization had contracted with that was not an employee to teach mm. their members something. And again, that was the second value, right? Uh, second identification of value is create value and then people will come to you um, mm. for that. So that was my next innovation as I continued in, in the elder law, estate planning and elder law area. And then my third innovation was I read The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Anyone who's getting into business, I absolutely recommend that they read The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It's a, it's a really a Bible for starting a business, talking about the three key roles, the entrepreneur, um, the technician, and the manager, and understanding systems and processes. So I did something weird, uh, Dale, when I read that. I, I didn't read it. I started to live it. And I remember coming back to my law practice and every quarter we set goals of new systems we would create, like how to answer the phone for an incoming call and how to do things. So over the course of 20 years uh, and continuing still today, uh, I continue to build systems and processes every day in my law practice. And then from that 2001 experience, uh, I founded then Lawyers with Purpose, um, which was a national organization to train lawyers how to do elder law, estate planning, and asset protection with systems, processes, trainings, tools, um, and technology. And so that's kind of how I got to where I am today and met Guy. So I think I'll let Guy talk a little bit about his background. And then I think a big part of our story today will be how an entrepreneur like me and an entrepreneur like Guy, who's in the UK and I'm in New York, how the heck did these two guys get together? And what happens when you put two entrepreneurs together? Is it two always better than one? Sometimes it's even mm -hmm. better than that. Yeah, man. I, lo I love the formula of one plus one equals three. That's where uh, the 11. Power partnership one comes One plus in. one is 11 if you do it right. <laughs> I like that too. 10 exit. Yeah. 10 exit. <laughs> Guy, how about you? Where, where are you from? What do you do? Well, listen, I'm, uh, you can probably tell from the accent, based in the UK, in uh, the, the north uh, of England, in Manchester. So famous for music and um, soccer, as you guys call it, football from where I come mm -hmm. from. Um, and <clears throat> unlike Dave, you know, Dave uh, said he was a, an entrepreneur that just happened to train as a lawyer. Uh, I was an entrepreneur because I was kind of bang average at everything else. You know, I um, came out of school at um, 18, uh, didn't go to university. Uh, I did okay, but didn't set the world alight at school. Um, and then um, I... Um, sorry, can you get the dog in the background? Can you hear the dogs barking? It, not no. too bad. Go ahead. Roll. Sorry. Okay. I'll carry on. So, um, I, so guys, I left we've had worse. We've had cats meow and sound like they're someone dying in another room. So <laughs> your dog's barking in an alley. They're totally fine, brother. I think it threw, threw me more than it threw everybody else. Apologies <laughs> for that. I'll, uh, I'll You're try to pick good. up where I left off. So, yeah, so I left school at, um, at, at 19 and um, worked in a, a supermarket as a, a store manager or worked my way up to a store manager for a few years. Um, and then I kind of discovered my inner geek uh, and um, got myself a job in a electrical superstore, which focused on computers and that kind of thing. And uh, met uh, a, a youngish guy that um, was keen to start up a, a business selling cars um, for car dealerships over the internet. So this is sort of the early 2000s, late, late mm. 90, sort of 1999, 2000, something like that. Uh, and, um, you know, we set that business up and uh, it went on to be uh, a big success. But I left after 18 months because I felt that, um, well, for various reasons, but the main one actually was that I felt I could do better myself um, on my own. Uh, so I took one of the, the guys with me that I'd employed there and we set a business up called Cake Solutions, which was um, a, a software development company. And, um, you know, for the first nine years, um, I, I kind of got my badges and scars. Um, you know, I had never run a business before in my life. Uh, we, we had um, some good times and we had a two or three really tough times. 
and, and you learn so much from those tough times. And, you know, one of the things I do now is, you know, try and help people avoid the same rabbit holes that, that I went down. But I'll come back to that shortly. Um, so anyway, we ended up in sort of 2009, 2010, focusing on a particular technology that was kind of it was kind of a risk. I bet the company at that point, quite frankly, because um, if this technology hadn't begun to take off in the way that we thought it might do, then we'd have been left high and dry with, with no clients. But as it turns out, it was a good bet. The technology started to grow. So we started to grow with the technology. And the technology was geared towards building um, systems with thousands of computers to deal with um, huge kind of consumer requirements. So it might be um, streaming video to millions of users. It might be, um, you know, um, doing price comparisons, um, several thousand kind of quotes per second, that kind of thing. So really high bandwidth, high data throughput, um, highly complex systems. We were really good at that. And this mm. new technology uh, allowed us to do it really well. Uh, and we were ahead of the curve at this point. And we, the other thing we were really good at was we were really good at self-promotion. So we didn't have a sales team at all. Um, we were, it was pre-podcasts. Uh, we're talking 2010. So we were actually into, first of all, writing books. Uh, then um, we moved into the um, the blog um, blog sector, and we began to you know write blogs. We actually wrote in the end seven hundred over a five year period, so we were mm. pretty prolif- prolific. Um, and we we spoke at conferences, um, techie conferences, uh, and um, we we just made a name for ourselves in this particular uh, sector. And um, you know what we found out was that you know two thousand seventeen we actually uh, we we had a few approaches for the company over the past two or three years prior to that, but uh, we had a really serious one back in 2017. And the company um, who um, uh, eventually acquired us had been following us for four years. Uh, and it wasn't until um, they had, um, had 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 some serious investment themselves, they got a billion dollar investment uh, from a, a major sort of US corporate that um they came uh, to us and it, it was just a really nice fit. Great for mm-hmm. the team. Um, they worked on a project that they'll probably never ever work on a project of that size again in their careers, most of them. Um, but it was, a, it was a really good offer and it kind of opened doors to, you know, allow me to do what I'm doing now, which is, you know, uh, took a year out as uh, I guess a lot of people do when, um, when you know, you, 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 you hit that situation. Uh, traveled a lot with my family, uh, had a, a great time, began to think about what, what I wanted to do next um, and, um, you know, started to invest in some companies that I liked, uh, I believed in um, and started to advise them. Uh, and then um, then I met Dave and it all changed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so so it was actually, um, we were in Toronto, would you believe? Um, we were at a, a coaching program called Strategic Coach, which Dave and I had been members for for, for, for a decade plus, actually. Um, but we never really met each other. And it was a British guy called Ash Fora who made the introduction around the lunch table uh, in Toronto. And uh, you know, Dave said to me, I need a tech guy. So I thought, oh, okay, um, I'm, I guess I'm a tech guy. So uh, we had a chat. And it was clear there was something there. You know, I could I could see what Dave was trying to achieve and it sounded like a really good idea, but I needed to know more. And Dave, you know, obviously got the feeling because Ash had introduced us that maybe I was someone that could help him. So Dave came to me at the end of that day, um, uh, just before the end of the day, actually, because he had to leave slightly early to catch a flight, gave me his card and we continued the conversation. Now, that was in October 2019. And we carried on the conversation and into sort of February, March, and eventually said, yeah, we're, we're going to do this. We, you know, this is a great idea. And technically, you know, I can deliver this. I've been doing it for 20 years. It's, it's not a problem. Um, so we agreed to, uh, to, to move forward with it. And um, of course, then COVID hit and uh, lockdown hit Europe first, I think. So we were locked down in March, um, weren't allowed out of our homes, never mind to an airport and, jump on a flight to, to, to go and work with Dave and his team in, in the US. So it was actually about four weeks ago when I've met Dave for the second time ever. Mm. 
I met the team for the first time ever. So that was over a two year period. We built this amazing platform. Um, it's up and running and trading uh, and we're growing the, 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 the growing the business. Um, and we did that um, without ever meeting face to face from the time we met until four weeks ago. Awesome. Um, it's the real, you guys touched on it and I, I'll hit it now before we get too far away from it. strategic coach. What is it? Who's it for? Why would someone join it? Oh boy. So if you look it up, strategic coach, Dan Sullivan is the mastermind behind it. He's, uh, I think currently 77, going to be 78 in June. Uh, his physicality and ment his mental is probably that of a 60 year old. Um, he's a brilliant, he's been a coach for many years. I've been involved with him for over 20 years and wow. uh, strategic coach is a, a coaching program for entrepreneurs. And, uh, a couple things. He's got some great books out who, not how the gap in the game. I think he's published over 20 or 30 books, but these are his landmark yeah. concepts and philosophies. And he has a contract that he's producing them with Dr. Benjamin Hardy. He's got two or three, four, two, three or four more coming on his core concepts. And so, uh, it's just a great program. Why? So I'm a person who believes in coaching. And I think that's a great insight too, for anyone getting into the business world. I actually have had four coaches that I've maintained. Mm -hmm. One is my strategic coach and I call them my visionary coach because when I'm with them, they're always, those coaches are always pushing me to innovate more, to become, you know, um, to create more value in the world and to the word we'll come back to guy. And I will come back to is collaborate and they have a unique mm -hmm. version of what they call collaboration. And so that was always one of my coaches and they always have been and still are my vision coach, you know, the entrepreneurial idea, helping you transform ideas into something real. The mm -hmm. other coaches I've had are, uh, the second one has been my business coach, meaning how do I run my businesses? Um, you know, managing people, you know, the people side of it. And, uh, mm -hmm. that I always use an organization called Vistage. They're a great organization and, they're really good at helping you because you're in a room with other leaders and there's a unique way that they process ideas and, and challenges that really help facilitate and move you through challenges you have with staffing or personnel or business operations or metrics or things of that nature. Um, the mm -hmm. third coach I always had was what I call a personal coach. And this person I've had for about 12 years and I just check in with her twice a month to make sure that I'm always being my full me, meaning that, you know, my success in business is not drawing me away from uh, my personal goals and wants um, or my spiritual, which leads to my fourth coach, which is my spiritual coach, my spiritual advisor. Um, as a Catholic, I love the faith, so I'm always trying to develop and, and uh, just like I developed my business concepts, developed my faith along the way. So those have always been the four coaches that I've maintained um, to help me, you know, always perform better. Coaches are always challenging you to perform better in each of those roles. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, I love you pointing that out because it's an area, obviously that's, you know, and to kind of back up what Guy said, you know, also being a unique opportunity, finding, hey, what can I do next in this next chapter? Um, you know, that, and I appreciate the list, right. And I appreciate the explanation of what a value is. Cause that's the value I try to deliver. Cause so what, what do you think in, in guy, you can chime in too, if you've got some experience here, um, how impactful has it been? Right. Like, as I know people, you know, the coaching thing today, there's a lot of people out there doing it, but I honor folks that say, look, I knew I didn't have all the answers. I went and got help. Like how, what would you say to someone who's trying to figure out whether or not they need a coach in their life to, you know, have find success? Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll pick up on that one. Just, I can only speak from my own personal perspective here, but the biggest thing I needed when I was in my early thirties and I started the, um, the business and then six or seven years after I started the business, I then went for coach, uh, went to strategic coach and I think that combined with one or two other things, which I'll come on to, um, that gave me, began to give me the confidence I needed to uh, allow me to operate at the level that I believe I can now operate at. Mm. I, I've always, I've obviously always had that in me, but confidence is such an important 
part of if you can unlock confidence then you know you you can be whoever you want to be so that was the biggest thing for me it was always about confidence um and it always has been from when i was a a kid through to when i started my business now i don't really have a massive confidence problem anymore you know i've kind of got over that one although you know i'm definitely more um back of house than 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 front of house you know dave's a very good uh front man and you know um you know face for the camera dave i've got a face for radio so uh (laughs) um but hey listen um so that was the first thing and then the the other thing that coaching gave me what i believe dan and most good coaches are um really good at are taking principles that help you run your business and simplifying them so it makes them really easy and accessible to use so dave's mentioned you know one of them already who not how so you know when when you think about it who not how is actually just it's a basic fundamental principle but he simplified it to the point that i just do it as a matter of course on a day-to-day basis now and what what that means just for clarity is that rather than working out how to deal with something find someone to do it who's your who Who's the who that's going to sort that problem out for you rather than worrying about how that problem's going to be done? Uh, it's a little bit of a mindset shift. It's just a shift, but it made the world a difference. Unique ability. You know, some I, I, you know, I've I always thought that people have had unique abilities, but what Dan did was provided a framework that allowed you to, you know, you he got you to do things like email 10 people, three colleagues three friends and four family or something along those lines and ask them to tell you not what you're bad at but what you're good at focus on what you're good at and then there was a whole tool thing that you went through yourself that you answered questions and ultimately you came out with a sentence that defined what your unique ability was Uh, and you go do you know what it's absolutely spot on. I get it now. It, it provides absolute clarity. So, I mean, the, you know, I could I could roll off 15 tools like that that um, have just really worked for me personally. Um, and I think they work for a lot of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs in particular, because they give you ways of thinking and frameworks to uh, work out what you're good at and work out um, how to help you run your business. That's what I think coaching is. Yeah, and one other thing too. Uh, again, Dan Sullivan is just brilliant. Um, uh, that's how Guy and I came together, Dale. Is this concept yeah. of collaboration? So it's a nice word. You look up in a dictionary. Oh, how cool! Everybody's collaborating. But Dan has a unique approach to collaboration, and and what it's about is is it's integrating unique ability, right? So unique ability. My dad always said, "Your God given talent, whatever you call it." There's something we're all really good at now. What I'm really good at is very different than what Guy is really good at. And it goes back to your one plus one comment a little bit earlier, Dale, right? You said one plus one is three. And I said, no, one plus one is 11. Because when you have two people with unique skills or unique gifts, then if they put those together, look, Guy, what he does, it marvels me. I, 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 can't, even, I, I can't even process what this guy does. And... Um, But he's probably somewhere when he looks at what I do, like he doesn't want to do what I do. I don't want to do what he does. But together, again, through mutual respect, common core values, right? You got to have the same core values. And then you bring your talents together. And that collaboration could add a third layer by having a third person. So Guy and I are always working with other people who have their own unique talents and have, again, our core values. And when you add them to our mix, it starts to become exponential. It's no longer a multiplier. It becomes exponential. And the key Mm. distinction, again, what I love what Guy said is that Dan finds a way to process and create tools to help you work through these concepts. For example, so that Guy and I built this company. Again, we started two months before COVID hit. We built an entire product, brand new digital product in an in a in an industry legal, which is very difficult, and we launched it all during a pandemic, um, and never having been in physical contact with each other for two and a half years, and so that's what great collaborations do. They use the skills of the people involved 
to bring about exponential, no longer multiple, like everybody talks about 10x, will now talk to the x percent. So talk mm-hmm. to the 10th power or to the second or squared or, or to the third power. That's what happens when you start collaborating unique abilities. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, it's as you guys have been talking, you know, just kind of thinking about that with regard to, you know, mutual respect, common core values. What other, you know, what other things, values, considerations do you think make a successful partnership? Go ahead, Guy. I, I, I'm just trying to think of a gag around prolonged periods of silence, but I just couldn't think of anything quick enough. Um, I mean, you know, I think, you know, Dave and I, you know, genuinely get on really well. What you see now is is how we behave when when we're together and we're having a chat. And even when we disagree on things, and we don't always agree on things, you know, but we have a we have a proper conversation and no one gets offended. No one's unprofessional. Um and it's it, it you know that that kind of conversation happens uh, in the in in the right way. So I think actually being able to get on really well with your business partners are really important. Um, you know, thing thing to happen. You know, Dave and I, I, I always call it. You know, it's like the beer test, isn't it? Right? Do I want to go out for a beer with this guy? Uh, and, and I do, and and we have yeah. uh, finally. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> yeah, we went right. out for, for for quite a few, if I recall, on the. Uh, the Tuesday evening and, and had a really good night with, with Dave and the rest of the team. Um, but that's how you get to know people. Uh, and that's another important aspect, I think. I think I would add that it's respect. I have so much respect for Guy. Uh, and for anyone I meet, and, this, and I don't care if you're a successful entrepreneur yet or not, um, every person I meet, there's something about them that's unique. And I think it's my job as an entrepreneur to figure that out because if, if I can define and understand someone else's uniqueness and if it goes well with my uniqueness, then I want to help create value in the world by doing that. So I think one of the things important with any partner, and my mother always said partners are for dancing, right? But, um, you know, <laughs> I think one of the challenges I know in partnerships that have not worked, so I could probably speak to that, is that. My mom always said, and I say my mom because she ran the family business and grew it. Her and my dad grew the business. They took it over in 1965. And by the time they sold it to my brothers in 91, 25 years later, they had uh, grow, grown it 37 fold. So when mm. my mother says something, there was a real business thing behind it. And she said, she said, you know, um, when you partner with someone, you're partnering with their spouses, you're partnering with their children and their problems and, and their successes. And so you've got to pay attention to what's around the people, um, right? If there's, uh, there's, if you look it up, there's so many different studies and so many different people have said your success will depend upon the six people you spend the most time with. And my mother always said, hang with people smarter than you, right? people that challenge you, that, that make you think in ways you hadn't thought before. Once we get to a point where we think we know something, every entrepreneur I've ever met, and I'd love your opinion on this guy in yours, Dale, because you've been around a lot of successful entrepreneurs. Everyone I've ever met that's successful is typically humble. They don't think they know everything. They're quite the opposite. They're trying to learn something new from everybody they reach. So I think if you ever get to the point where you feel like you know something a little more than everyone else, I think you might want to check in with yourself um, because there's so much more to know. Um, I think those are the key things, that respect, which ultimately comes from understanding that as good as we are, as successful as we are, as much money is in our bank accounts, that doesn't measure compared to what we're capable of when we use those unique abilities, those God-given talents, and combine them with other people who have theirs. So our job as entrepreneurs is to find other talents. We got Wherever they are in their success is irrelevant, but what are their talents and how do we help those talents bring about change that impact? And that's the key word, has impact on society in a positive way. Yeah. I yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, you know, the... The thing I really enjoy about um, 
well, one of the many things I really enjoy about the, the entrepreneurial group we, we're a member of, and I think this will apply to many entrepreneurial groups, by the way, uh, is that entrepreneurs, I think, on the whole, have very similar mindsets. And they're actually quite hard to find people with those mindsets outside of the, the entrepreneurial world. Um, now, you know, to Dave's point, you know, I've, you know, I, my, my friends, one of them is a, you know, my closest friend, one is a, an entrepreneur and my other two really close friends, one is a, you know, a, manages a building site and one manages a retail, um, a retail store. Um, so very kind of different people and I've known those for years, but they're all smart people and I, I get on with them really well. And, you know, we're, we, we are really close and kind of best, best of friends, but actually the, the, the mindsets of, of people like Dave and other people within strategic coach, um, mean that, you know, when we're talking about business or whether we're talking, uh, about sport over a beer at the end of the day, um, we all have great conversations and we just get each other. We just click. It's no effort. It's easy. Uh, and I really like that. Oh, oh, that's my favorite four letter word. E-A-S-Y. When you're in the zone, when you have a unique ability, it's easy to you. And matter of fact, most yeah. people ignore it because like, oh, that can't be my unique ability because that's just way too easy. Um, and what's really cool is when you get in an entrepreneurial environment, whether it's Strategic Coach, Abundance 360, The Vistage Organization, all of these organizations, you're around other people, quote, just like you. And mm -hmm. what happens is what you realize is most people that are successful entrepreneurs, they got there from all different paths, but there's certain patterns you find, right? Like traditional education. For most of them, the traditional education didn't work as well. For me, it was just a part of my entrepreneurialism, right? Because I had the mm. gift of growing up in that in that environment. But I, I think um, I will tell you this: um, when I met Guy, and this has been true of other people I work with in organizations that I belong to, are entrepreneurial organizations. There's an instant element of trust because you understand that they've experienced the world that you've experienced. You know, we we as entrepreneurs business owners, whatever you want to call it, we're responsible for feeding, putting food on the table of not only our own families, but the families of all of our employees. Hmm. And more importantly, helping the people of the products we're creating for society, right? We're, right? Entrepreneurs create a value that this is, they create something of value that society wants or needs and are quote willing to pay for so our goal as entrepreneurs and no one knows the entrepreneur's journey more than an entrepreneur so if someone's listening to this they understand sometimes you feel like you're the odd duck out sometimes you feel like your brain isn't working right because everyone around you is so and i i'm going to say this and i i don't mean it to be judgmental but ordinary they kind of get up they do their thing to them wake up put in their time and get back home and put the boob tube on. You know, I get all that, but, but that's not the way my brain works. I don't think that's the way most entrepreneurs brains work. You know, most people go in a mall and they go shopping. I go in a mall and I'm counting floor towel. I'm looking at racking. I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering how many, how many turns they have to have on a rack. And I'm thinking about how much it costs to be in the small or the shopping center. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I can't not, think that way. You know, I'm always trying to figure out how can I make it better? How can I, when I see someone struggling with something, I would say, is there something I could do to make that less stressful or make it easier for someone? Again, that word easy. So I think entrepreneurs think a step differently, but when they find each other, there's a natural affinity and, and that affinity helps to make it easy. I will say this, if you are in a partnership or any relationship, this extends beyond business, that is not easy, let that be your, your guiding principle in light, that maybe something's mm -hmm. not right, that maybe you don't belong in that relationship. So if it's not easy, pay attention to that. Yeah, I love it. I mean, and you guys have been knocking down a lot of the questions I have for you because that was it. Like, what? how do you know if a partnership's going sideways? And I think that's a really great point. Like, you're starting to run into, um, like, say, it's starting to be a be a little bit of friction, maybe some issues that are seem, seem unresolvable. And, and you guys hit on a lot of like, just 
maybe maybe it's erosion of some of the values that you guys talk about, like especially like mutual respect and knowing, you know, which hat you're wearing and why. Um, I mean, it, my uh, company, I, I came to, when we exited, we had three partners total, but we all knew what hat we were wearing, had total respect for each other's part to be played and let, let each other have that role and, and own it and support one another. And even, even if it was a part of the conversation, you know, I heard this, I said this, you know, in our partner meetings many times that, you know, Hey, I wouldn't do it this way, but it's your call, you know, and, and I'm not yeah, going to be here to say, I told lane. you so after, right? Yeah. Uh, and I always stay in your lane that. and respecting each person. It's like recently guy and I were really struggling and not arguing at all, struggling with what's the next best hire, right? We've got to mm -hmm. start up where we've hired three, four, five. We've added it to my company of 30 plus and we're like, okay, what's the next best role? And, and I believe strongly it's one role and he believes strongly it's another. Well, I don't come in saying, well, I'm right and you're wrong. And he doesn't come in saying he's right. I'm wrong. We come in asking questions. We say, okay, yeah. tell me more what you're thinking. Help me understand why you think that role is more important. Let me tell you what I'm thinking, right? And that's how we engage it. Because in the end, here's the key thing. You ready? In the end, we both want the same thing, right? It's not about being right. It's about both of us being right in our decision that we ultimately make, not about him being right to go his way or me going right. Because in the end, if the decision we make isn't right, we're both accountable to it. So if we have the same goal and the same vision, then it's really about asking the questions to understand what the other person's thinking as to why they think that role might be more important. And I think that goes to what you said, Dale, about, you know, you had three partners and you had a nice sale and, and to get anyone to agree on anything. But when you're all focused on the same thing, you know, my mom, I love always using my mom as a story because I didn't know, but in my whole life, she was just full of these statements. And she said, you know, you can argue in life. She says, when you find somebody important, and she was talking about a relationship that you would marry, but I think it parlays to business. She said, when you find someone to marry, you can argue over what color you're going to paint the bedroom but you can't argue whether the kids are going to be baptized. What was her point? Mm -hmm. She said, we have fundamental beliefs that, that we have. And Guy and I as business partner have fundamental goals that are spot on. We want the success. We both own the company. We both want its success. There's our core value. We can argue over whether we hire the first guy first or the second woman second or all this other stuff. We can, we can discuss that stuff, but you can't lose sight of the big things. Everything you do has to be focused on those bigger things. So that's kind of how I feel. Guy, any difference for you as you think about some of the? No, listen, I hundred percent agree with what you've uh, the way you summarized it, Dave. I've got nothing to add. I mean, we we kind of speak the same language, don't we? So um, I noticed <laughs> at the start when we were you know when we were chatting away at the start, we where Dale asked a question and we both um, answered the question exactly the same time with exactly the same answer um it was almost like oh, i thought oh that's a bit spooky i've been uh, i've been working with you for too long um but you know we, we and you're, you're still right, working with me so that's a good sign yeah listen we 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 well, like anybody we we agree on most things um but there are things we we, we occasionally disagree on and and sometimes you know you get you just take the view that you go okay look I might be right. Dave might be might be right. Let's just pick one and go with it, and 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 see how that works out. And if it doesn't work out, then we'll pivot, and you know we'll we'll just move forward and and not worry about what's just happened, and 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 try something different. And 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 you know that's a that's a key principle, I think, in a, in, in a business, not just with your business partner actually, but for for dealing with with um, situations in general. You know, I think any successful business um, will have many failures within that business um but it, the, the the key to it is not dwelling on them and to move forward now moving forward might mean that you just can the idea altogether because it probably just wasn't a good idea uh, in reality um but um occasionally it'll mean pivoting and, and 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 just trying to tweak it slightly and doing something different um so yeah so it's it, it you know it it, it it's that kind of thinking, I think, that um, allows you to to have a culture within your business that is willing to try stuff, um, is willing to fail, um, and and knows when to end something, but equally knows when to stick with it and just try it in a slightly different way. And I would say, yeah, I'd love it. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I was going to say that, that um, <laughs> with regard, I'm going to take it now. Too late. Go Whenever go, New Yorker gives you, the, gives you the mic, man, you take it and run. Don't don't give it back. The, uh, no, I was I was going to say, you know, and and like what guy's saying, like I'm sitting here smiling, shaking my head, yes, the whole time because you know what you guys are saying. It's just I don't know in partnerships, and I would say just generally success for a moment, right? We're talking, you know, value alignments, vision alignment, right? Um, you're talking ego, uh, ego avoidance and all these things. And I, you know, I, I honor all that because it's been my experience. That is, that is how you win, you know, is, is that, if, that if you have complete alignment of your values and your vision, uh, your partnership will, will go places. It's when, you know, one, one or both or more have an ego of they want to see it their way for no really better reason than it being their way. Um, you know, you don't, that's, that's where the trouble starts. And, uh, and, and it's a slippery slope from that point. And but I would add to what you said, Dale, and what Guy said is I always like to anchor to behaviors because talk is conversation and it relates to people differently. There's two behaviors that are absolutely unacceptable in any business relationship. And this is true of me and Guy, but it's also true of all the way down our chain of command. The first one is excuses. And the second one is blame. Those two behaviors, if anyone is ever saying or blaming someone or providing excuses, they don't belong on the bus. Because in the business world that we're in and what we're trying to do, it's not about blame and excuses. It's about assessments and pivoting, as Guy said. So Guy and I may talk about something and we may decide to go with the way he thought was better or me, or we might blend a new way together. But either way, it may not be right. The trick mm-hmm. is not to come back and say, well, I told you not to do that. What, what usefulness is that? It's yeah. not like he told me to do it because he wanted us to fail. And it wasn't because I said something because I wanted to fail. It's about assessing. What were we thinking? How did we make that decision? Why were we so wrong? And then I could tell you this from every entrepreneur I've ever met. They've never had a business failure. They've had things that failed, but what they came from it was always a lesson greater than the failure. Would you say that's true, Dale and Guy? Yeah, listen, um, do, do you know what? It's an interesting point that, Dave, because the the US has a slightly different view on failures than the UK. Uh, and and I'm with the US on this one, by the way. Um, the, the culture in the US is that business failure is okay um, because it happens, right? And, you know, it happens and there's nothing wrong with people trying something and for whatever reason, there could be any number of reasons, it hasn't worked. Um, and it's not a stain on your character or, or you know, um, you know, uh, a reason why a bank won't back you again and that kind of thing, unless you've been underhand or out of order. Right. But, you know, if it's a genuine business failure um, because, um, you know, the, the market wasn't quite ready for it or the, the situation in the world changed and you just weren't able to uh, react in time and that kind of thing, then, you know, that's more accepted in the US than it is in the UK. In the UK, um, it, it, it is viewed with a certain stigma. Uh, and um, the, some of the institutions in the UK, particularly the banks, really take a dim view on it. Your credit rating drops and everything else. It's harder to get a loan in the future, whereas, you know, really – People should be taking a really pragmatic view on these things, unless, as I've said, you've been out of order in some way. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I'm I'm with you guys. Yeah, on this I don't one. think we can count. If you, I think there's billionaires, multi-millionaires. There's so many who have gone bankrupt. Now, sometime not. I know one one of my mentors. He went bankrupt twice. I mean, he mm-hmm. ended up being a probably a multi 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 millionaire. Because he eventually, like you said, figured it out, you know, and, um, you know, nothing should be irreplaceable, right? Nothing should be ever irreversible, I should say. And that's the key thing as in business. Don't a a short term failure does not warrant long term failure. Um, That's a mindset, right? So it's another big key thing about business owners, their mindset. Their mindset doesn't say I can't. It says, how can I? Yep. Right. Entrepreneurs, they say, how can I? And so many, I mean, I could tell you when someone says the word can't to me, it's like a dagger right through the chest. And I, I literally physically stop because it takes my breath away when I say, well, I can't do that. I'm like, what do you mean you can't? You mean you won't? Mm-hmm. 
I said, let me ask you a question. Change it and say, how can I? Just say, how can I? And it changes your brain thinking by changing the can't to how can I? And again, that's Mm -hmm. really a a lot of it. And even sometimes, you know, we we don't always get there in the path we think. Um, You know, recently someone had a challenge in their life, a friend of mine, and they were really questioning, how can this happen? Why? I I said, that you don't know the reason now. But when you get through it and get to the other side, if you sit there and, you know, bludgeon it to death and carry it as a, as a stigma the rest of your life, that's very different than what you learned from it. Learning from the mistakes is the greatest triumph of failure, is learning from Let it. Me, I'll tell you one of my frustrations, Dave, and, and um, it, it, you know, I think you'll resonate with this, and, and Dale, I'm sure you will as well, actually, is when you come across people who find reasons not to do something rather than looking for reasons to, to do it, I just get so frustrated with situations like that um, because my mind doesn't operate in that way. I'm always looking for a reason to make something successful, a reason to do something. Um, and there are so many people out there who just look for reasons not to do it. And I'm like, you know, I just want to get them and say, look. It just sucks just the life right out of mindset. you, doesn't it, guys? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's that sucks. scarcity versus abundance mindset, too. You know, I, right. I think that's a big tell when the I can't and the, the why we shouldn't. You know, those are what I found anyway to be more of the scarcity mindset folks, meaning there's the reason they're saying they can't or reason they're coming up reasons why not is because of fear and, and scarcity, you know, the way, and you said it, right. The way they're, way they're looking at things, their, their own perspective on life in general. You know, on the flip side, just cause we can, doesn't mean we should. Right. Yeah. So I've been in situations, I'll give you a perfect example. I was asked to run for a political office. It was actually a judgeship. Mm-hmm. So it's not political, but in, in New York here, you run for that position. And mm-hmm. this was back in 2008. And, uh, I'm like, geez, I don't know. Let me look into it. And so what I did is I said, give me 30 days. So over 30 days, I I looked into the position. I started to look at the markets who I would have to go to to do all my campaigning and all this other stuff. And uh, and at the end of the 30 days, I was absolutely convinced I had created the path to victory, which was assured later because that was the year that uh, – uh, I just would have, I, I, it, the whole party won that year. So it was like, okay, I, I assured the path to victory. And as soon as I assured the path to victory, then I said, okay, I've won. Now, what did I win? And again, these are my three favorite words. What's the prize? So mm-hmm. when I looked at the prize, I'm like, shit, excuse me, probably shouldn't say that. But I'm like, <laughs> heck, what, why would I want that? And I walked away. Actually, I ran away from it. And, and sometimes just because we're entrepreneurs, we come up with great ideas and just because we can do it. And even if we've, we've crossed all the T's and done all the I's and done it, it doesn't mean it's still the right thing to do. And now there might be moral reasons, but there might also be, it's really not that big of a help. You know, I always find it's all about the value it creates. So it might create value to me, maybe sometimes, or to a small group of people, but it's really got to impact the masses to have a bigger impact. So not everything that you can talk through and even work through needs to be pursued. That's the other part of it too, I think. Yeah. And hey, I Dave, think I think I would, it, well, I, I was, was going to add I, to I, it uh, real quick. The, uh, the thing with that is too, because a lot of us don't think about that opportunity cost, right? That, you know, right. It, you, yes, we can do that, but what is it costing us and what's the impact or, you know, et cetera with that. And that's, you know, so go ahead, guy. Sorry. No, it was, yours was far more insightful comments. Um, I, w- I was going to suggest that if there was any TV producers uh, watching, that I think uh, Judge Dave, a show would just be incredible. <laughs> the smile like that, and you know the 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 charisma, It'd be amazing. Oh, can you imagine an entrepreneur as a judge? Entrepreneurs color outside the lines, and and um, oh, yes. you know, judgeships <laughs> all about staying within the lines, and uh, well, which, you, and while they should be, and while the they movie. should be, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, so crazy. coming off the conversation about you know successful folks haven't had multiple bankruptcies and things like that. You know, one of the questions I wrote down, I would like to hear from you guys on. You know, tell me. You know, guy mentioned confidence. We've talked about failures. Like, how important is courage in entrepreneurship? 
Uh, huge. Um, I mean, I think confidence and courage are two different things, personally. Um, confidence is just believing in yourself for me. Uh, it certainly was for me. It would be different for different people, right? So in my interpretation of confidence was having a belief in myself and allowing myself to um, do what I was actually naturally pretty good at as it turns out like I said you know if I wasn't an entrepreneur I really don't know what else I'd be doing I wouldn't be playing football I wouldn't be a lawyer um I probably wouldn't be a talk show host um you know so uh, being an entrepreneur I think is what I was I was destined to uh to 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 be I think courage though is a really important one and we haven't kind of touched on that you know there um, I I was on a a podcast recently called honey uh, I blew up the business uh, and it was with a British guy called Dan Kirby, and it it generally sits in the top ten business podcasts uh, mm. on Spotify and uh, on Apple Music, I think. Um, Apple Podcasts, I guess, rather than music. Uh, and um, you know that focused on uh, th- when when things go wrong with your business. That's why it's so popular because mm. everyone talks about stuff that goes right all the time. Very few podcasts or books or you know content generators um concentrate on stuff when where you know and and areas when stuff goes wrong and you know i can tell you if you listen to the episode i'm in on that that podcast i talk about three times in my business when i sailed very close to the wind the business almost went under and there but for the grace of god um you know we, we we got through it um and that took courage because you know on one of those occasions i remember um that uh, we just bought a house in auction. It was a, let's call it a doer-upper. Most people would call it falling down, but I'll call it a doer-upper. Uh, and uh, it required a ton <laughs> of work and therefore a ton of money um, putting into it. So, um, you know, at the worst possible time, uh, we'd bought this doer-upper uh, and the business was going through a really tough period. And I just put um, th- that point, um, twenty-five thousand pounds, which I don't know what's that, thirty-five thousand dollars, onto my credit card to pay my personal credit card to pay for the wages that month. Uh, and if we hadn't got a deal that had come through, th- that combined with other debt I had with cars and various other things, and I'd just taken on this big liability of a house, um, then uh, I'd have been bankrupt. And it was, you know, it was. Um, it was quite an intimidating time and it did, it required a lot of courage. And quite honestly, I was carrying that on my own at that point because I couldn't tell my wife exactly what was going on um, because I didn't think it really was fair to her. So she knew bits, but not the whole picture and quite how bad things were. Um, And, you know, there's been other occasions where, you know, I've had to delay a family holiday for a week. My wife and my uh, with with the two kids, I've gone out uh, on a two week holiday, and um, you know um, I've held back for a week because I had to make sure certain things were done within the business to make sure that we could cover wages at the end of that month. So those tough periods um, require courage, they require tenacity, um, they just require absolute focus as to how to get out of it by hook or by crook, and we did. And after those periods, you know, we just went from strength to strength to strength. It's having the belief in what you were doing would come good and, you know, could become huge. And that's exactly what happened. I love it. Dave? Any you thoughts? know, I love the distinction between confidence and courage because um, I, I think I got to say this in a way that's impactful, I guess. But sometimes us quick starts don't always think it through. I, I think there's a very fine line between confidence, courage, and stupidity. Now, what do I mean by that? Maybe that brassness, right? Oh, I, I'm going to go jump out of a tree because oh, I'm, I'm brave. No, you're an idiot. Okay, you, you don't yeah, jump out a of a tree. Face, right? Isn't it, Dave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, th- it's blind not blind. Face. It's yeah. This is faith in yourself based on your knowledge, and th- this is what's important. Th- and this comes back to me to how we conduct ourselves in life. If you're a lifetime learner, and that's a, one of my favorite phrases in life, I think of every entrepreneur I've ever met, I've never met one that was not a lifetime learner. Because 
entrepreneurs are always learning something new. And so the more we learn, we put it in a backpack, right? And it's always there for us to recall. Now, the things we learn that are bad or negative, we turn them into positives and say, okay, how can we make sure this never happens again? Or how can we even make it where other people don't have this happen to them? Because sometimes our failures could be a value to others to help them not to make the same failure. That's why Guy and I come on shows like this and talk. Because we've been through, I think Guy said he's black and blue from from, from some of the the things over the years. Any entrepreneur will be black and blue over time from, Mm -hmm. you know, it's challenges and overcoming. So really what it comes down to, I think, Dale, is a mindset of confidence based on knowledge. So it's not a blind confidence. It's not an arrogant confidence, but it's knowledge that gives you confidence. And with that confidence, you get courage because even if you know and think, and you could see a path, it still takes courage to do it. Um, And that's the key distinction. Confidence is the step to kind of get you knowledge is going to build the path, but the actual courage to do, because I, there was a big distinction in my my national legal organization. One of my former partners always defined the term entrepreneur versus entrepreneur. And we always define the entrepreneurs as those people we have in our companies that we love. They actually grow our business for us. And we say, well, you know, why is it so many entrepreneurs say, well, I'm not going to do that with them because then they'll go compete with me. They'll do it on their own. And what I've always learned is that the difference between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, those people in our companies that bring us the greatest success is their adversity to financial risk taking. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be really blunt. Entrepreneurs risk financial capital. That's what makes us different. That's single thing alone, not risking our name or risking our reputation. That's all true too. But until you put your name, till guy put that $30,000 personal payroll uh, on his credit card. I mean, there was a time 2007 when the market crashed, 2007, eight, nine, I had a law firm that was growing like crazy. It had made revenue goal 39 months in a row. And my, my, my lowest level staff were getting $2,500 bonuses at the end of the year. And it was a great time. And then all of a sudden, October came and our revenues for that month went to half of what they normally were. We went, oh, this is a glip. So hmm. half, we went, oh, there goes a big chunk out of our savings account. Then the next month, bam, it hit again. Boom, there goes another big chunk out of our savings account. Well, by the time three months was up, I mean, I had to go from 22 employees down to 11 in a three month period. You want to talk? And then, and in that time period, multiple six figures went on a debt revolving line of credit at the bank. Hmm. Okay. And then you figured out, shit, something happened here. What was it? Right. Well, we all know now looking back at 2007, eight, and nine, and all the bubble that burst and all that stuff. But when you're in the midst of it, I mean, the same thing happened when, when COVID hit, right? Everything's, I mean, when in any of our lifetimes, my dad turned 96 on Friday. I said, dad, did you ever imagine a time in your lifetime? I, talk, I talked to him back in COVID. He goes, I've never seen anything like this. And he goes, I've never, I've never had a time in my 96 years of life that I couldn't go to church. Hmm. Right. Cause of COVID businesses stopped government shut the governments, the world shut down. Now, again, in America, thank God we had big brother who came out and just started throwing cash everywhere because that did help entrepreneurs, but many suffered and lost and Mm word could not maintain during the COVID crisis. So I think so many times during our entrepreneurial experiences, there's outside things that we can't control, right? We can't, you know, the dot com burst of the 2001. I was in business then. I saw the same mm-hmm. thing. You know, how do I, how do you get through this in the moment? You know, looking back, we can define it. We can say what we learned from it. But in the moment, holy mackerel. But I will say from living through the 2001 uh, dot com bubble burst and the 2009 uh, burst, when, when COVID hit, we were able to adapt much quicker because you're able to recognize it and shift. And that's, I think what's important too, is to learn from those outside influences and pay attention to people smarter than you. Like we had to rely on a lot of outside people and there's a lot of outside people, you know, who had a lot of opinions, um, but really weren't effective. So being able to sort through all that becomes very difficult. 
Yeah, I love it. I mean, <laughs> again, I can only smile and nod because I just agree with so much of it. They, you know, the outside consultant thing, the folks, you know, and that to me, it like comes down to like, and, and you put it right, opinions. And and I always tell entrepreneurs or other leaders like, hey, like know that the decisions is your, the decision is yours and you need to own it. Now, and that's not to say you can't listen to outside counsel and opinion and commentary or whatever. But don't defer, like don't give your sword to them, right? Because it's yours and it's, it's at the end of the day, it's on you. So regardless of what some expert consultant's telling you to do, if you're not feeling it and no matter what, it's still at the end of the day, it's not his or her decision, it's yours. So if you do what they tell you and you, it's not congruent with maybe how you're feeling about it or whatever, at the end of the day, you, you may regret that, you know, and, and, or, or the times that you need to be humble and say, yeah, I am out of my depth. So that, so I need to, you know, follow the counsel of this expert mm -hmm. advisor because I truly don't have an opinion or whatever, or, or get smarter, right. You know, use their advisor to get, get educated, to make the right move. So well, and, and in I each think one of these cases, I think it came down to a really critical thing. I think the cost of indecision was far greater oh, than yeah. the cost of making a decision. Yeah. Absolutely. And as Mr. Miyagi says, right? Remember Mr. Miyagi, the karate kid? Or maybe it was Yoda. I forget. Maybe I think it was Yoda. Do it's a bit or of a don't difference. do. Do or don't do. No try. Right? Yeah. So we don't try. Oh, we'll try that. No, no, no. Do or don't do. No try. I think it was Yoda. That's Yoda. Hanging on the wall right there. I know oh, that there one. he is. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, no, that's I'll awesome. Think, well, I, I mean, Go ahead, I think guys. Yoda must have been speaking to you, Dave, because you had no idea that Yoda was on Dale's back wall there, did you? Well, all, I only see half of his face now that I see it. I thought it was a planet. <laughs> I thought it was a green planet, but now I can see the nose and the eye. <laughs> yeah. Subliminal. See, that's all the subliminal stuff at work. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as far as you two, you know, you're getting a lot done. Like, what do you think, what habits are contributing most to, to your, your success? Individually, what's what's what stuff that you don't compromise on as far as, as far as your habits, routines, growth? Yeah, I'll 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 start with that one. So f for me, um, it's it's not a personal habit, but it's um, every every entrepreneur's success is always about the team that the entrepreneur builds around them, and how good that team is. Uh, it, it's rarely solely about the entrepreneur, rarely. Uh, it's always about the team. So for me, you know, the, the, the habit that I've got into in all the businesses I'm involved in is ensuring that I build teams around either myself or the leader of that particular organization and help them do that um, and, and, and help them build teams that supplement what their unique ability is, what, as Dave calls it, what their God-given talent is. So, you know, I'm going through the exercise with Guider at the moment. So, you know, we've built the platform from people that used to work for me uh, in my old organization that um, over the last sort of four years have set their own business up. Um, they've left, you know, the new company, uh, they've set their own business up and they're doing their own thing. And I, I really mm -hmm. admire that. And A, I want to support them, but B, I know them. And I respect them and they wouldn't have been working for me in the first place if they weren't good. So I know they're, a, they're going to do a terrific job for me. So it made absolute sense for me when we, when we started to, to, to talk about this, reaching out to um, the, these groups of people uh, in, within my network and, and bring them in as uh, either contractors or contracting companies to help us build the platform. But now we're at the stage where, you know, we're moving out of the startup phase and we, you know, we're hopefully we're right at the bottom of the the high growth phase now. So to prepare for that, you know, I've got to now employ my own um, engineering team uh, in preparation for any uh, investment further down the line or any acquisition further down the line. Because you know, if you are a tech company by de de definition, you have to have a tech team, and it's really important that that tech team is. Um, you know, under your employment rather than um, a, an external company, which is considered quite rightly to be uh, more of a risk. So, you know, I'm now building my unique team um, to to help uh, do that. So, you know, for me, the habit I've got in all the companies that I deal with is always looking at the senior team that's built around either myself or the entrepreneur that, of the organization that I'm working with. 
Yeah, for me, when I look back um, on my success, um, two things come to mind. Um, and I'll start with the more difficult one. Um, and then I'll start with the, then I'll end with the easier one. The more difficult one was learning uh, communication skills. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm supposed to learn how to communicate. But I mean actual learning, uh, reflective listening, uh, learning how to get into the pers- other people's perspective. You know, all of us are always selling something, right? Every every conversation, when you meet someone new, you're selling yourself, right? Um and so we're always in our own mind and we live there. The, the skill of getting into other people's minds and understanding, and here's the key word, from their perspective, what they're thinking. You could think what you think and be against uh, talking to someone who thinks totally opposite. And then that's just a fight. But to really ask a series of questions and reflect that person to understand why they think that way transforms your own thinking. And, you know, if, if, if I want to be right, you know, my wife calls it a right fighter, right? People want to be right fighters. Well, the best way to not be a right fighter is to understand what other people think and why, what's their rationale. Let me understand how it is they come to that thinking. And there's, you know, reflective listening is one example of that social styles, identification, things of that nature, a lot of the social sciences. So I think those are really critically important to make us today. I think it's so important to be emotionally intelligent, right? Emotional intelligence is so important. And then the other thing that seems easier, but perhaps is much harder, uh, is I have been disciplined to planning, planning. So in strategic coach, the guy and I started this conversation with, um, we, I've been, you know, seeing Dan in, in a closed room environment for a day for in excess of 20 years. Um, and that happens every calendar quarter. I've never missed. I just, every calendar quarter, I go into a place, not my office, not my, my surroundings. I go to be around a whole bunch of entrepreneurs just like me to carry on a higher level conversation to stimulate thoughts and to say, okay, what all these thoughts that I've stimulated, what do I want to do with them in the next 90 days? And everything is about a 90 day framework. And Dan gives us a 25 year framework and then a 90 day framework to work within the 25 years. So that's number one. But then I take that quarterly and I actually do annual. So at the end of the year, I'll actually take another day when I come back and I'll look at all the things I did the past year, all the things I learned. And I'll tell you in a moment how I know that because during the year, I'm tracking monthly and weekly my goals. So when I go quarterly and I set my annual, I say, all right, for my annual goals, what do I want to accomplish this quarter? And then each week I track what, how, what progress I've made, what challenges I've overcome, and what new challenges have been presented. And in a systematized order, I created a planning system that helps me plan into my future, right? Most people are stuck in the present. Actually, most people are stuck in the past. Um, they're always, what happened yesterday, and Betty was mean to me, and when I was 12 years old, he tripped me, and all this other stuff, and they're wasting so much of their life. And then there's the other group who's always focused in the present. Oh, my God, what shit's going to hit me today? They wake up, and what can I get done today? What can I get done today? And they lose access to their future. So I live in the future and I'm always moving forward. And as Dan Sullivan always said, I love it. Always measure by your progress, not by perfection. So many people say, oh, I want what that person has. And Dan always says, that's the rainbow, right? That's that's perfection. Well, if you measure what that person has compared to what you have, there's a huge gap between where you are and they are. Well, as a quarter goes by, you've made some progress, but guess what? That person that you're meant, you're watching, they've made progress too. So now the gap just got bigger, didn't it? Well, well, the Dan's second book, The Gap and the Gain, is another great conversation to keep yourself out of the gap and the, to always acknowledge the progress you've made rather than focus on the gap between where you are and where you want to be. Because if you're always looking forward, you're always going to want to be somewhere further than where you are. That never ends. If it Mm -hmm. does end, you're not an entrepreneur. 
And so ma managing that gap versus the gain, which is the title of his book, and again, one of his core concepts, is really important in how you manage that. And my world is through planning, being in those conversations and then breaking them down to say, okay, and here's the key things, converting conversations into concrete actions and goals. And that's what it is. And I think there was a study in 1984 by Harvard University, and they they measured the success, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but they measured the success of their graduate students. And they of their graduate students, 13% had goals and 4% had written goals. The other 83% didn't have goals. They followed up with all that, that class 10 years later. And what they found was the 13% that had goals on average earned, are you ready? 10 uh, uh, earned twice as much as those that never set goals. And the 3% that had written goals earned 10 times what the people with goals and no goals combined achieved. And so that's the power of having written goals because otherwise they're just thoughts. Thoughts don't become real until they're declared in, in verbal to someone else or until they're written. And so writing for me is a time because not everybody wants to hear my crazy ideas all the time, but when I write them, it helps me understand how crazy they are or how crazy they aren't. And then it helps me filter through and then create obje objective benchmarks to make in 90 day increments. I love it. Yeah. I mean, and it's up and a lot of that is about clarity, right? You're bringing clarity to the goals. You're bringing clarity to your thoughts and ideas. You know, I, I love it. Uh, we've been at it for, for over an hour, gents. What, what, uh, what, what's, what's exciting that you guys are working on now? So we, um, let out, if you don't mind, I'll just talk about Guider very briefly. So we've been building this platform, um, which can be found at guider.legal. And it's G U I D R. So we're trying to be cool. There's no E. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, if you go there, and um, the idea is that this thing is a legal document platform. And, um, you know, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, enable law firms, small and medium sized law firms, to compete effectively um, and, and uh, more effectively, actually, than some of the um, legal document platforms that are, are you know are, are forming everywhere, like LegalZoom and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and the idea, you know, the, the benefit of uh, working with local lawyers is that you know the documents that are, are generated are genuinely legal documents. Mm. Um, you know, they can uh, they're hard to contest in a court of law, whereas if you um, just use a, a legal document template you found on the internet and you paid a few pounds for or a few dollars for, then um, much easier to contest in a, in, in a court of law. So, you know, we're just trying to enable um, small and medium-sized law firms to digitize some of their services. And we've started yeah. with, um, uh, it'll be no surprise really, uh, Dave's speciality area, which is the estate planning area. Um, so, you know, wills, healthcare proxies, um, Medicaid documents, um, you know, um, potentially some trusts as well, uh, slightly further down the line. Um, so the system's launched and operating in many states around the US, uh, soon to be all states. Uh, so, yeah, if anyone needs a will, healthcare proxy, um, power of attorney, um, then, you know, um, go down to guided.legal. Yeah, I, I think the key distinction here is, and again, my my entrepreneurialism has always been in the legal industry, particularly around estate planning, elder law, and asset protection. And what we saw was the erosion of lawyers by these big, large self-help platforms. And while they're easy and quick, they are not lawyers. So we said, how can we give the consumer the best of both worlds? How can we give them that easy and quick um, and lawyers. And so that's what the guider platform does. It says to lawyers, Hey, become relevant. The world has changed. They, people don't want to come in your office anymore. They don't want to sit there and listen to you. They want to be able to do it on their couch at two o'clock in the afternoon or 10 o'clock at night. And so that's what the guider platform does. It allows the consumer to choose. And here's the power to choose how they work with their local lawyer. So do they want to do it themselves inside the local lawyer's system? with a local lawyer checking it 
uh, in the background, never having to talk to that to that individual? Do they want the local lawyer to help them along the way, or do they want the local lawyer to do it for them? So it's a new digital platform that connects lawyers with the consumers and lets the consumers choose how they want to work with the lawyer to get the legal services. And that's the power of it. And so you're working with the lawyer. You're not cutting out the lawyer. You're getting all the wisdom of the lawyer at the level and rate that you choose as a consumer. Yeah. I mean, if I could summarize, you guys tell me if I'm wrong here, but what I'm hearing is you guys are enabling local lawyers to, to be more efficient, to automate, to scale, to be accessible. Um, because I, I've always looked at lawyers, CPAs, I came from IT services and, and IT folks, like we're, we're in a trusted advisory space, right? And, right. and people want to know who their advisors are, you know, I mean, personally, I've never done like a legal zoom for that reason. Like I, I, I don't want to download a file. Like, like I said that I'm at risk because all it is a piece of paper. I want to work with an advise a legal advisor who can say, what are you doing? Okay. We're going to set you up for success. We're going to protect you. Here's how I would do it. Right now, you've got a, a trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. um, so what I hear you guys are doing is you're you're bringing that a digital version of a legalized trusted advisor, the way people are used to doing business today in, in a really yes. accessible, efficient way. Yeah, I love yes, it. So we're That's moving awesome. that elephant called the legal industry into the 21st century. <laughs> Kicking think, and screaming, they, no doubt. Yeah, yes, the, I'm the sure they <laughs> The, the, the posh term is that we're uh, digitizing and democratizing uh, legal services. Yeah, and we I did write it. a no. book too. Um, we did write a book called yeah. The Digitization of Law, How to Transform Technology Disruptions into Abounding Opportunities. Uh, and you can see Guy and my name on that. We wrote that together. And that was a great collaboration too. It's about an hour read, a little more if someone wanted to read that. But um, it, it's the wave. It's the, the legal industry needs it. Uh, and society needs it. Um, the way people have traditionally worked with lawyers has always presented some challenge. So we're just trying to break down some of those barriers. Yeah. And look, hashtag entrepreneurial, like you're solving a problem because it is a problem, right? And, 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 you know, where the world's moving faster than ever, thus the legal issues are coming at you faster than ever and, and doing this right and efficiently is, is a problem to be solved, you know? So I, I love it, you know, very... You know, again, I, I where you started out, Dave. You like you're an entrepreneur that happens to be in the legal space. I mean, exactly. That's that's and in its in, in its essence, what you guys are doing today. So it's it's awesome. So good. Well, mm -hmm. hey guys, I mean, it's been an honor to have you guys on. How how can uh, people find you online? What what should they be looking for, and where can they connect with you? Yeah, sure. So um, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, under Guy Reeman. So I'll spell that because. Uh, we kind of had this conversation at the start, uh, Dale, didn't we? It's, it's not an easy name to spell. So it's G-U-Y and then R-E-M-O-N-D, Guy Remond uh, on LinkedIn or G Remond at Guida.legal. And uh, way back then when I said I needed a tech guy, I didn't mean his name had a B guy, but I just, you know, it just turned out to be that way. Um, but uh, I'm D Zampano. Uh, Z U M D is my first name. D is in David D Z U M P A N O at E P law center.com. That's uh, one email or guider dot legal D Zampano at guider dot legal or D Zampano at E P law center.com. Either way will find me. <laughs> Great guys. Well, yeah, no, I, I I've had a blast and ton of, ton of value. I've got a page of, notes just from the, all the value you guys have been dropping today. So I, I appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your story and all your insights. Uh, it's been a, been a great experience. So I uh, appreciate you. It's going to serve a lot of people out there to get a chance to listen. And uh, I hope to find ways to collaborate with you guys again in the future. We look hey, forward listen, to it. I've, uh, yeah. Thanks for the invite on the show. And uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Ditto. All right, guys. Thank you very much.